The next chapter talks about measuring a nation's income. Now, it might be helpful for you uh, throughout this chapter or throughout this presentation to have a calculator handy because there is some calculation in this chapter. It'd be, you can get some good practice calculating real and nominal GDP and a few other measures. This is the first purely macroeconomic chapter in uh, the text. It covers the definition of GDP, the spending components of GDP, real versus nominal GDP, and the GDP deflator, and why GDP is useful but not a perfect measure of a nation's well-being. So let's revisit microeconomics versus macroeconomics. Microeconomics is the study of how individual households and firms make decisions and interact with one another in markets. Macroeconomics is a study of the economy as a whole. Now, again, this is the first strictly macro chapter in the textbook, so it's worth spending a moment emphasizing the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Some examples of questions that microeconomics seeks to, ex to answer include, how do consumers decide how much of each good to buy? How do firms decide how much output to produce and what price to charge? What determines the price and quantity of individual goods and services? How do taxes on specific goods and services affect the allocation of resources? Now, examples of questions that macroeconomics uh, seeks to answer include, how do consumers decide how to divide their income between spending and saving? What determines the total amount of employment or unemployment? What determines the overall, life, uh, overall level of prices and the rate of inflation? Why does the economy go through cycles where things go great for a few years, like the late 1990s, and then lousy for a year or two, like the early 2000s? And then lastly, when, an when unemployment is high, what can the government do to help? So, we'll begin our study of macroeconomics with income and expenditure. Now, income and expenditure, uh, a measure of income and expenditure, I should say, is growth, gr gross domestic product, GDP. Now, GDP measures total income, the total income of everyone in the economy. Okay. GDP also measures the total expenditure on the economy's output of goods and services. For the economy as a whole, income equals expenditure. Because every dollar a buyer spends is a dollar of income for a seller. So let's take a few notes here. In the text, in the first bullet, the, 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 te the text in the first bullet point, if I could speak English today, is not, not the formal textbook definition of GDP, if you will. The formal definition is given and discussed in detail immediately after the circular flow diagram in the chapter. Now, again, GNS in this slide, it means goods and services. Now, a good way to judge how well someone is doing economically is to look at his or her income. We can judge how well a country is doing economically by looking at total income that, that everyone in the economy is earning. GDP is our measure of the economy's total income. It's often also called the national income. GDP also measures the total expenditure on the goods and services produced in the economy and the value of the economy's output, or you could say production, of goods and services. Thus, GDP is referred to as, quote-unquote, output. Now, the equality of income and expenditure is an accounting identity, not, for example, an equilibrium condition. So, it must be true that income equals expenditure when we're talking about GDP and economics. Now, um, we've briefly introduced the circular flow diagram previously. It's a simple depiction of the macro economy. It illustrates GDP as spending, revenue, factor payments, and income. Now here are a few preliminaries. Factors of production are inputs like labor, land, capital, and natural resources. 
Factor payments are payments to the factors of production. Payments for, say, wages and rent. Now, in the circular flow diagram, we have a few players. We have households who own factors of production and sell and rent them to firms for income. And they, these households also buy and consume goods and services. Now, we also have firms. Firms buy and hire factors of production and use them to produce goods and services. And the firms are the ones that sell the goods and services. Now here's the full circular flow diagram. In this diagram, the green arrows represent flows of income or payments. The red arrows represent flows of goods and services, including services of, of the factor, factors of production in the lower half of the diagram. So firms have to buy factors of production to produce their goods and services. To keep the graph simple, I have omitted the government, the financial system, and the foreign sector as we discuss in the next slide. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what you see here, and if you remember back from earlier on in this course, um, we have the households and the firms, and we have the two markets, goods and services, and factors of production. Households provide labor, land, and capital to market factors of production, who provide those factors of production to firms, who create goods and services that are sold in the markets for goods and services, which are bought by household, households, and around and around we go. Now, on the other end, households spend money in the markets. That revenue goes to firms. The firms pay that revenue to the markets for factors of production in the form of wages, rent, and profit. And that brings income into households. Okay, So households are both suppliers of labor and also consumers. Firms are both uh, buyers in the markets of factors of production and sellers in the markets for goods and services. Now, what does this diagram omit? Well, first thing, big thing, is the government. The government collects taxes and buys goods and services as well. The financial system, which matches savers, uh, the, the, a saver's supply of funds with the borrower's demand for loans. And then the foreign sector, which tra also trades goods and services, offers financial assets, and has currencies uh, in the, offers currencies with the country's residents. So it offers a medi medium of exchange in currency. Now, in future chapters, we will study the role of each of these in greater detail. And, well, we could draw a more complicated circular flow diagram right now that includes government, financial system, and the fi uh, foreign sector. However, including them would not change the base basic conclusion that GDP simultaneously measures a totals, or our country's total income, expenditure, revenue, and factor payments. So we move forward with the current model. Gross domestic product, GDP, is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given time period. Goods are valued at, at market prices, so all goods measured in, are measured in the same units, for example, dollars, U.S. dollars. And things that don't have market value are excluded. For example, housework you do for yourself. Okay, so if you vacuum your own house and don't hire that out, uh, that's not captured in GDP. So that's something you do yourself. This slide and the five that slides that follow focus on the meaning of each part of, of this critically important definition of GDP. Now let's note that, that transactions occurring in so-called underground economies or black markets are also omitted from official measure of GDP. In the textbook, near the end of the chapter, there's an in the news box that contains an excellent article on underground economies, if you're interested. Now, again, GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. Final goods are intended for the end user. They're what you consume as an end user. Intermediate goods used as components or ingredients in the production of other goods, i.e. things that go into final goods, are not counted in GDP. GDP only includes final goods, final products. They already embody the value of the intermediate goods that are used to produce them. Okay, so think of final goods as the, the final dish, the final soup, and intermediate goods are 
the ingredients that go into that soup. Now GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. If you've noticed, I'm reading the same definition over and over, yet I'm putting emphasis on the highlighted words. GDP includes tangible goods like DVDs, mountain bikes, beer, etc., etc., and intangible services like dry cleaning, concerts, cell phone service. They're intangible, but they are a service that, you're, that you want to consume. GDP is the market value of final goods and services produced within a country in a given time period. GDP includes currently produced goods and not goods produced in the past. So goods that are produced now. GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. GDP measures the value of production that occurs within a country's borders, whether done by its own citizens or by foreigners located there. So U.S. GDP measures the value of production um, of goods produced here in the U.S., whether by citizens or non-citizens. GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time, usually measured as a whole year or as a quarter, which is three months of the year. Now, the year has four quarters in it. Okay. GDP can be reported quarterly or annually. Now, there are some components to GDP. Recall GDP is total spending. The four components include consumption, abbreviated as C, investment, abbreviated as I, government purchases, abbreviated as G, and net exports, NX. These components add up to GDP, which is abbreviated, denoted as Y. So GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus net exports. Now net Exports means, um, first of all, what you export, but the net export also considers what you import. So do you send out uh, more goods than you take in, or do you take in more than you, than you send out? Do you import more, or do you export more? Well, your net exports, if you uh, import more, will be negative. And if you export more to other countries, that's goods produced here, it will be positive. So it's uh, each of the four components is defined and discussed in detail on the following slides. You're going to want to memorize this. Okay, Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. Let's talk about consumption. Consumption C is the total spending by households on goods and services. Pretty straightforward. Now note on housing costs, for renters, consumption includes rent payments. For homeowners, consumption includes the imputed rental value of the house but not the purchase price or the mortgage payments. Mostly the term consumption refers to what, what you would probably already think of as total consumer spending. The note about the treatment on owner-occupied housing is an exception. And you may be tested to see if you recognize uh, the difference between renters and homeowners and how particularly homeowners are calculated. Okay. So again, renters is the consumptions. The consumption includes what they pay in rent. But for homeowners, consumption includes the imputed rental value of the house. So it's put in terms that match what renters get. But not the purchase price or the mortgage payments because these are current payments occurring now. You can't put the whole purchase price or the mortgage payment unless you bought the whole thing at once, which most people can't do. Now, next, investment. Investment is the total spending on goods that will be used in the future to produce more goods. It's an investment. And it includes spending on capital equipment, for example, machines and tools used to produce future products. So if you buy a new tractor to produce more corn, that's capital equipment spending. Investment. Um, structures, for example, building a factory, an office building, or houses. Inventories, goods produced but not yet sold. So investing in having goods on the shelf that you can send out when your customers need it. Now note, investment 
It does not mean the purchase of financial assets like stocks and bonds, which people traditionally think of. Investment is investing in uh, total spending on goods that will be used in the future to produce more goods. Okay. Now, more on the, the treatment of owner-occupied housing that we talked about before. In the national income and products account, national income and product accounts, a house is considered a piece of capital that is used to produce the flow of goods and services, i.e., housing services. When a consumer, as a tenant, rents a house or apartment, the consumer is buying housing services. These services are considered consumption. So the price paid for these services, i.e. rent, is counted in the consumption component of GDP. When someone buys a new house to live in, he or she is a producer and a consumer. As a producer, he or she has made an investment, the purchase price of the house, that will uh, produce a service. So in that way, it's like an investment. He or she is also the consumer of this service, which is valued at the market rental rate for that type of house. So the accounting conventions treat this situation as if the person is his or her own landlord and rents the house to or from herself. Okay, so if I can make that more complicated for you, let me know. I didn't come up with this, folks. It's economics. When students, and it's complicated by accountants, but neither here nor there. When, it, when students begin to understand this, when you begin to understand this, you may wonder why certain goods like cars that produce a flow of consumer services are not also treated in this way. There really is no good answer. Okay? It's just a convention of national income and product accounts. It's economists and accountants gone wild. Just keep in mind, for homeowners, consumption includes the imputed rental value of the house. So it's not necessarily the purchase price of the mortgage payments. I like to think of it as um, like the other slide, and like we mentioned on the other slide, it's like the homeowners renting the house to themselves. Okay, what they pay, what they would pay in rent if the house were rented. Now, government purchases. Government purchases are it's all about spending on goods and services purchased by the government at a federal, state, and local levels. They buy things. Okay. G, which is government purchases. Excludes transfer payments, so such as Social Security and unemployment insurance benefits. They are not purchases or goods or services. So when a state government gives something to a local government or a federal government gives something to a state government, those transfer payments aren't considered. Now, transfer payments like Social Security checks are excluded from, from G to avoid double counting. Retired persons spend part, of, part or all of their Social Security benefits on food, rent, prescriptions, and so forth all of which count in consumption. If we also counted the Social Security check itself as a part of government spending, then the same money would be counted twice, which would make GDP look bigger than it really is. Now, net exports. NX equals exports minus imports. Exports represent foreign spending on the economies, goods, and services. So what foreign economies buy, say, from our, from our economy in the form of goods and services. Imports are portions of C, I, and G, so it's portions of consumption, investment, and government spending that are spent on goods and services produced abroad. So we send our cash outside the country. Adding up all the components of GDP gives you Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. Now the net and net exports refers to the fact that we are subtracting imports from exports. This subtraction is very important because imports are also counted in other components of GDP, namely C, I, and G. Failing to subtract them would cause GDP to measure not just the value of goods produced domestically, but also produced abroad and imported. For example, if a consumer spends, let's say, $100 on a DVD player imported from Japan, that, count, that $100 counts as consumption, even though the player was not produced domestically. So we subtract off that $100 import to G so that GDP ends up including the value of only the domestically produced goods and services. So it cancels itself out. Now, U.S. GDP and its components as of 2013. Okay, some big numbers. Uh, there may be an updated version of Table 1 in, in this chapter of the textbook, but generally you get this... Um, uh, information from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is www.bea.gov, if you're interested. 
and you can also get population data from the census. You can also get a good bit of information from the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, some big numbers here, okay, with total GDP made up of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Okay, you can tell what percent of GDP they are. When you have a negative for net exports, you can actually see here that you must be importing more than you're exporting. Right. Now, per capita terms means per person. So this is the GDP per person. This is the consumption spending per person, investment per person, and government spending per person, and net exports per person. Just thought you might be interested in that. So let's work an example, or work through an example. Now, GDP and its components. In each of the following cases, determine how much GDP uh, in each of its component is affected, if at all. In A, Debbie spends $300 to buy her husband dinner at the finest restaurant in Boston. Oh, that's nice of Debbie. B, Sarah spends $1,200 on a new laptop to use in her publishing business. The laptop was built in China. C, Jane spends $800 on a computer to use in her editing business. She got last year's model on sale for a great price from a local manufacturer. D, General Motors builds $500 million worth of cars, but consumers only buy $407 million worth of the cars. I'll give you a moment to reflect on that while I switch the slides. Now, let's look at A and B. Debbie spends $300 to buy her husband dinner at the finest restaurant in Boston. Consumption, in particular, and GDP overall, rise by $300, so it's consumption. Part B, Sarah spends $1,200 on a new laptop to use in her publishing business, but the laptop was built in China. Now investment, she's investing in her business, rises by $1,200, but net exports fall by $1,200. GDP is unchanged because the laptop came from overseas. Now, C, Jane spends $800 on a computer to use in her editing business. She got last year's model on sale for a great price from a local manufacturer. Current GDP and in investment do not change because the computer was built last year. Kind of a tricky question there. The computer was built last year. Remember, this is annually or quarter to quarter, so we don't care about last year. We're current, we currently care about this year. That computer was stock. It was um, overhead stock from last year. Now, D... Uh, or excuse me, let me speak towards Jane. Jane's purchase causes investment for her own um, home business to increase by $800. However, the computer is sold out of inventory, so inventory investment falls by $800. The two transactions cancel each other out, leaving an aggregate investment and GDP unchanged. Okay, that, that's why the computer didn't count. All right. Now, D, General Motors builds $500 million worth of cars, but consumers only buy $470 million of them. Well, consumption rises by 470 million inventory investment rises by 30 million and gdp rises by 500 million so we had some inventory to keep okay uh, problem part d um, this problem illustrates why expenditures always equal output when even when firms don't sell everything they produce due to a lackluster demand the point here is that unsold output is counted in the inventory investment and even when the investment was unintentional. So General Motors would have loved to have sold $500 million worth of cars. They just didn't do it. They sold $470 million worth of cars, so they have $30 million in, in investment. Now, if you think back to Part C, um, you could say the same thing about the computer. The computer company hoped to sell all those computers last year. But they didn't. So Jane bought one this year. Well, we've already counted that computer, that $800, as inventory last year. So that's why we don't count it again this year. Now, real versus nominal GDP. Inflation can distort economic variables like GDP. So we have two versions of GDP. The first one's nominal GDP. The values um, output using current prices and not corrected for inflation. Inflation is the overall rising, uh, r rising of prices. Okay? Over time, prices rise. That's called inflation. So when you compare GDP from one year, say 
10 years ago to this year, to put them in real terms, you have to calculate real GDP, which means values of output using the prices on a base year and is corrected for inflation. Okay, The dollar today is more highly inflated than the dollar 10 years ago, for example. To compare the two time periods with GDP and compare U.S. dollars GDP, you have to convert things to real GDP, so you're comparing apples and apples and accounting for inflation. So nominal GDP does not account for inflation. Real GDP does account for inflation. Now, for example, this example, this example is similar to the one given in the text, but it uses different goods and different numerical values, so you can get some reps here. Now, um, my suggestion to you here is uh, to ask you to compute nominal GDP in each year before I reveal the answer, so you can pause the video. And then I would ask you to compute the rate of increases before re revealing your answers. Okay? In this example, nominal GDP grows for two reasons. First, prices are rising. That's inflation. And the economy is producing a larger quantity of goods. Now, thinking of nominal GDP as total income, the increase in income will overstate the increases in society's well-being because part of these increases are due to inflation. Okay? We're going to overstate it because we're not accounting for inflation. We need a way to take out the effects of inflation, so we're comparing apples to apples, to see how much people's incomes are growing in purchasing power terms. That is the job of real GDP. Okay? So we're given this yearly data. We're giving the price of pizza. You can see the price rises. You can see the price of lattes rise. And the quantity demanded changes too. Now we can compute the nominal GDP in each year by saying, okay, 10 times 400, 2 times 1,000, adding them together. If this is the only two things in the, in the country, 6,000. Okay? 11 times 500, 250 times 1,100, 8,250. 12 times 600, 3 times 1,200, 10,800. Okay? The increase year over year from 2011 to 2012 was 37.5%. From 2012 to 2013 is 30.9%. But this is all nominal. We know inflation plays a role. Now, let's compute the real GDP in each year using 2011 as our base year. So we can compare apples to apples. This example shows that real GDP in every year is constructed using the prices of the base year, and the base year doesn't change. The growth rate of real GDP from one year to the next is the answer to this question. How much would GDP, and hence everyone's income, have grown if there were zero inflation? Thus, real GDP is corrected for inflation. So we're using a base year of 2011, when it was a price of 10 and a price of 2, and you got 400 pizzas and 1,000 lattes. Okay? Same data as before. We're just considering a base year. 2011 is the base year. Now, we keep, we're keeping prices the same here. 10 all the way through, 2 all the way through. And we're just looking at growth in the quantity. Okay, we're just keeping the base here. This is a very oversimplification of the process. 10 times 400, 10 times 500, 10 times 600 plus. Uh, so 10 times 400 in 2011 plus 10, 2 times 1,000, 10 times 500 in 2012 plus 2 times 1, 1,100. 10 times 600 plus 2 times 1,200, and we get these GDPs, this total consumption here, okay? Just considering that this economy only does two things, pizza and lattes. We should all be so lucky. Okay, 6,000 to 7,200 to 8,400, the increase in real GDP terms is 20% and 16%, 16.7%. That's a lot lower than 37 and 30.9%. But keep in mind, inflation will cause you to overstate your GDP growth. Okay? Thus, the real GDP is corrected for inflation. A very oversimplification of something that's actually much more complex. But you get the idea. Now, the table on the top half of the slide merely summarizes the answers from the previous two slides. Okay? Nominal GDP and real GDP. The table is used, will be used shortly to compute the growth rates in nominal and real GDP and to compute the GDP deflator and inflation rates. In each year, the nominal GDP is measured using the VIN current prices. 
okay, for that year. Real GDP is measured by using constant prices from the base year. For this example, 2011. Now, again, the growth rate of real GDP from one year to the next is answered in the next question. How much would GDP, and hence everyone's income, have grown if there had been zero inflation? Okay, that was the question. Well, this is why the real GDP is corrected for inflation. Remember we kept the price at $2 for lattes and $10 for pizza? Well, that indicates zero inflation, whereas we know prices kept going up over those three years. Now here we see this 37.5% and the 30.9% versus real GDP. Nominal GDP changes at 37.5 and 30.9, and then real GDP changes of 20% and 16%. Okay. The change in nominal GDP reflects both prices and quantities. The change in real GDP is the amount GDP would have changed if the prices were constant. For example, if, uh, in other words, if there were zero inflation. Hence, real GDP is corrected for inflation. It's a more conservative es um, estimate. You can't compare multiple years without controlling for inflation. Or you could compare them, but you're going to get different numbers than you would if you had rightfully controlled for inflation. Now, nominal and real GDP in the U.S. from 1965 through 2013. Okay. That is from mostly from the U.S. Department of Commerce and Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA.gov. So since we just finished covering real versus nominal GDP, it might be worth pointing this out to your student, to, to, to you as students. The graph shows that nominal GDP rises faster than real GDP. This should make sense because the growth in nominal GDP is driven by uh, growth in output and inflation. Now, growth in real GDP is driven only by output because we control for inflation. The two lines cross in the year uh, 2009 here. The base year for real GDP, which is the base year of the real GDP in this graph. We're putting everything in $2,009. This should make sense because real GDP equals nominal GDP in the base year. Okay. Before the base year, real GDP was greater than nominal GDP. For example, in 1981, nominal GDP is about $3 trillion, while real GDP is about $6 trillion in 2009 dollars. This should make sense because prices were so much higher in 2009 than they were in 1981. So using those high 2009 prices to, value nine, to the value of 1981 output would lead to a bigger result than valuing 1981 output using 1981 prices. So the GDP numbers are higher than they would be in, the, say, 1981 because we're using 2009 numbers. So similarly, after 2009, the nominal GDP is higher than the real GDP, and prices are higher uh, in later years than they were in 2009, because so, inflation keeps going up and up and up. Now, the GDP deflator. Okay, the GDP deflator is a measure of the overall level of prices. Now, by definition, the GDP deflator is 100 times the nominal GDP times real GDP. Okay, the 100 is there just to con uh, convert to percentage terms. Okay. Uh, because the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP is going to be a small number. We want to convert it. Um, uh, so we multiply it by 100. And one way to measure the economy's inflation rate is to compute the percentage increase in the GDP deflator from one year to the next. The GDP deflator gets its name because it's used to, quote-unquote, deflate, i.e. Take, uh, take the inflation out of nominal GDP to get real GDP. So it's like a converter from nominal GDP to real GDP. Okay. It's supposed to make it simple for you. It's a converter. Now, here's our example again. We have a nominal GDP and real GDP. Okay, and The GDP deflator here where we calculate uh, nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. Nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. Okay. Nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. It's 100%. Okay. 
that's the base year, 2011, 100%. Okay. Now, nominal divided by real times 100 um, is 114.6. That means there's a 14.6% increase from 2011 to 2012. All right. Now, uh, 10,800 divided by 8,400 times 100 is 128.6. You take the difference between the two, you get a 12. 0.2% increase um, from 2012 to 2013. Okay, That's the percent change from 100 to 114 is 14.6 and the percent change from 114 to 128.6 um, is 12.2%. So here's how we compute the GDP deflator in each year. All right, again, 6,000 divided by 6,000, nominal over real times 100, 8,200 divided by 7,200 times 100, Okay, and 10,800 divided by 8,400 times 100 is 128, and then we see the percentage change from each year, 14.6% from 2011 to 2012, 12.2% from 2012 to 2013. So computing uh, GDP as, a, as an exercise here, um, the data in this table is from uh, a hypothetical economy that produces two final goods, good A and good B. For all parts of this problem, we use 2011 as the base year. Okay, so first thing you want to do when you're doing a GD problem is figure out GDP problem is figure out what year you're using as a base year. If you're running short on time, um, or you want to you want to make this a little less challenging, we can just skip right through um, this uh, exercise, or you could pause it here and make the calculations. So we have the base year of 2011. Um, we have our prices and our quantities for good A and good B. Then we have 2012, price and quantity for good A and good B. 2013, price and quantity for good A and good B. We can use the above data to solve the following problems. We can compute nominal GDP in 2011. We can compute real GDP in 2012. And compute uh, GDP deflator in 2013. Okay, so if you want to pause right now use this information to make those calculations, um, go ahead and do so. And uh, we'll come right back with the calculations here in a second. First, we're going to take a look at nominal and real GDP. Now, computing nominal GDP in 2011, okay, nominal GDP, nominal GDP, is simply 30 times 900, the price times the quantity, plus 100 times 192, okay? All right, and you get 46,200. That's nominal GDP. Now we can compute the real GDP for 2012. Okay. Now 2012, I'm sorry, 2012, the prices went up to 31 and 30, uh, or 31 and 102 respectively, up from 30 and 100. Well, we want to compute the real GDP, so we keep the price 30 and keep it 100, and we multiply it by the quantity. So 30 times 1,000 and 100 times 200. And we get a real GDP in 2012 of 50,000. Now, computing the GDP deflator in 2013. So we've done nominal GDP for 2011 because that's the base year. That's fine. We've done um, real GDP for 2012, um, which is the one year removed from 2011 to get the actual, um, the real GDP. Now we can compute the GDP deflator in 2013. Okay. How we do that is nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. Okay. Now our nominal GDP okay, is 58,300 in 2011 and our real GDP is 52,000 from um, 2012. Okay. So our GDP deflator tells us 100 times 58,300 divided by 52,000 is equal to 1.12.1. Now this is our first year um, moving from nominal to real, so we know just right off that's moving from a GDP of 100 to 112.1, one, so we know prices went up by 12.1% from 2011 to 2012. Now, GDP and economic well-being. What does it all mean? Real GDP per capita is the main indicator of the average person's standard of living. 
Now, I'm sure you've heard uh, standards of living um, in different areas and how we match up, okay? But GDP is not the perfect measure of well-being. Uh, Robert Kennedy issued a very eloquent yet harsh criticism of GDP, which for some reason doesn't want to appear here. Here it is. There we go. On gross domestic product, RFK. It does not allow for, for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of public officials. It measures neither our courage, nor our wisdom, nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America except why we are proud to be Americans. The late Senator Robert F. Kennedy, 1968. I have to say, that's a pretty strong criticism of GDP as a pure measurement of our standard of living. Pretty impressive. Too bad he got shot. All right, GDP does not value the quality of the environment. It does not value leisure time, which we know we all enjoy that. Some of y'all enjoy that a little too much. Get back to studying, folks. Non-market activities such as child care, a parent provides at home. So if you stay at home and provide for your kids, that's some high-quality stuff. That's not an easy job. I've done it. Okay, But it's not counted in GDP. That's, cr that's crazy. An equitable, equitable distribution of income. So how the income is distributed among the um, members of society. So much of what Robert Kennedy said about GDP is correct. Then why do we care about GDP? Well, having a large GDP enables a country to afford better schools, a cleaner environment, and health care, etc. It's better to have more, right? Many indicators of quality of life are positively correlated with GDP. So, uh, we'll have an example here um, in a second. But one thing I want you to think about. Then why do we care about GDP? Okay. Well, think about it. A large GDP doesn't, in fact, help us to lead a good life. GDP does not measure the health of our children. The nations larger, the nations with, but the nations with larger GDP can afford better health care for their children. Okay, whatever you say about our current health care, um, at least we have those resources available. We have surgeons for basically everything you need. GDP does not measure the beauty of our poetry, but nations with larger GDP can afford to teach more of our citizens to read and enjoy poetry. Right? We're not always looking for our next meal. We can study things like poetry. GDP does not take into account our intelligence, our integrity, our courage, our wisdom, or our devotion to our country. But all of these laudable attributes are easier to foster when people are less concerned about being able to afford the, the material necessities in life. In other words, if you're not too worried about where your next meal is coming from, you can go to college and study things. Okay, You, can, um, you don't have to fight for your own survival. You don't have to go to war. Okay, you can take time to learn things like that, all right? And you can take time to learn more about poetry. Um, you can electively decide to devote yourself to working on your courage and integrity by joining, say, the military. But that's an optional thing. It's not a, something that you're forced to do like you are in some countries. In short, GDP does not directly measure those things that make life worthwhile. But it does measure our ability to obtain the inputs into making a life worthwhile. So think about that on a philosophical level. Now, back to this second bullet point. Many indicators of the quality of life are positively correlated with GDP. I don't know how many of you are taking stats, but positive correlation basically means, well, if you have a high GDP, you typically have high X, Y, and Z. Okay? So these other things are, are typically correlated with those with better GDP. Now, uh, GDP and life expectancy looking at 12 countries. We see GDP goes up over this axis here. So if you're further to the right, you have a higher GDP. And then if you're higher up, you have a higher left life expectancy. So you can see a correlation here that as real GDP goes up, life expectancy, it seems like all the big countries with a high GDP have a higher life expectancy. Okay, That's, that's kind of a good thing. Far right quadrant. This figure and the two that follow are from uh, data from Table 3 in the textbook. Real GDP per capita figures are expressed in U.S. dollars. Okay, so this is all in U.S. dollars, and this data comes from the United Nations. All right. Average years of school, 
So higher you get up vertically here, the more education you're getting. And the real whoop, whoop, whoop. average years of schools, higher you get up in here, the more education you're getting. And the higher you get up over here, the higher GDP. So as you can see, as education gets higher, GDP gets higher. Um, there's a correlation there. So the higher the GDP, usually the opportunity presents itself to get more education. So this is average years of schooling is among adults 25 years and older. So it's people who have already mostly graduated from things like college. The three unlabeled countries within five years of schooling are from left to right, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Pakistan. So this little clump right here. Okay. Now, GDP and water quality in 12 countries, kind of a big deal, right? Our bodies are made up of three quarters water, so we need water. So satisfaction with the water quality, higher quality water, yes please. As GDP increases, we see higher GDP countries get higher levels of water quality. Okay, so there's some correlation there. Now, in summary, gross domestic product GDP measures the country's total income and expenditure. The four components of GDP include consumption, investment, government purchases, and net exports. Nominal GDP is measured using current prices. Real, GDP's, real GDP is measured using the prices of a constant base year and is corrected for inflation. Okay, It's apples to apples in real GDP. GDP is the main indicator of a country's economic well-being, even though it is not perfect. Now, in summary, people face trade-offs. Hey, that keeps popping up. That's from the first chapter. The cost of any action is measured in terms of foregone opportunities. Rational people make decisions by comparing marginal costs and marginal benefits. And people respond to incentives. Another principle of economics from the very first chapter. Okay. Sorry, I got stuck on a slide here. And that's actually the last slide. They just repeat it here. Um, so this wraps up the chapter on GDP and measuring a nation's income. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me um, an email, give me a call on the office phone, or drop by during office hours. I'll be happy to help you out. Thanks so much.